once again, and oh my goodness, Wall Street is occupied. Oh dear, what are we going to do? Yes, you've probably seen the footage now, all sorts of uh, young people and assorted other miscreants uh, de descending upon Wall Street and assorted other places to uh, protest. Well, no one's really sure exactly what they're protesting. I don't even know that they are. Uh, it seems to be a general idea of, oh, we hate the rich and anybody who's rich has screwed us over, blah, blah, blah. It's kind of your uh, typical leftist talking points. Uh, now uh, foistered into action uh, with a bunch of young folks that look like they would be better off in rehab than they would be protesting something. But uh, that's sort of what I want to talk about today, this uh, Occupy Wall Street movement that's going on right now. And, uh, you know, I've got to tell you, when this whole thing happened, when I first started seeing the footage on it, I went through a range of reactions on this thing. When I first uh, saw the, the pictures of this and what was going on, my very first reaction was a rather visceral reaction. Just, just almost a, a disgusting reaction, a hateful reaction. Uh, I, it, was, it just literally turned my stomach, uh, as I suppose it always does when I see people that are publicly uh, browbeating and publicly demonstrating against the very ideals and the very things that have built America and made it great. And, you know, when these kids are out there protesting against capitalism and, and you know, the American way, frankly, yeah, it, it, it gets my temper going real quick. It's the old Merle Haggard song, when you're running down my country, you're running down the fight inside of me. Well, I think these, these idiots were running down our country and, and our way of life and how America has grown over the last 200 and some years. The, you know, they, when, when you talk about America, you talk about capitalism. You could not have America without capitalism. And so when you're, when you're protesting that, I got a real problem with it. So yeah, my first, my first reaction was a, a visceral one. And, and I'll tell you, this weekend when I was seeing this for the first time, my, my thought was, I, I got to tell you, the New York Police Department, they just, they just have a lot more patience than I would because my first thought was, take a nightstick to every one of those bastards. But, you know, there have been limited issues. They haven't... They haven't gone over the top the way I probably would have if I would have been there. So uh, I suppose there's some patience that we have to give them some credit for over in the NYPD. But uh, yeah, my, my, first, my first reaction to all this was a very hateful one. That I can honestly, could have honestly told you at the time that I hate those people who are protesting. I hate those people who believe that way. But then as I looked into this a little bit more and I researched it a little bit more, I saw that these, these people had put out a list of 13 demands of, well, somebody, they never really said who, uh, but they put a list of 13 demands out there. And I read through their demands, and, and you can find these about anywhere. You can Google it or, or go to just about any news website and find these. I'm not going to go through all of them, but uh, I, I, read, I read through it, and, and a few of them stuck out at me. Things like they're, they're guaranteeing a living wage income regardless of employment. So then uh, where is the incentive to actually get a job and be productive and do anything at that job? I don't know. Uh, demanding a free college education, which begs the point, if everybody has a college education, then is it really worth anything because everybody else has what you have? How does that make you stand out in the marketplace? Well, I guess I didn't think of that. Uh, some of their other demands were racial and gender equal rights amendment. Um, pardon me, I think you guys go late to the, the party on that. Um, all races and all genders already have equal rights. I think you guys missed the boat on that one. Uh, some of their other demands are open borders migration. Anyone can travel anywhere to work and live. Wait. <laughs> are you also going to tell me I have to leave all my doors unlocked and any squatter that wants to come into my house can do that? Come on. Uh, and then immediate across the board debt forgiveness for all. Commercial loans, home mortgages, home equity loans, credit card debt, student loans, and personal loans. So basically, you wouldn't have to pay for all the crap you've bought. I think we call that stealing. Oh my god. Oh, they want to outlaw all credit reporting agencies. So when I read through all those demands, only a portion of which I gave you here, my reaction went from hate and disgust to kind of a perverse humor. Uh, I almost thought it was funny. I mean, I'm reading through this thing. And, and it, it comes off like a bad Saturday Night Live skit. 
Uh, these people are demanding things that, that, frankly, you would expect to come out of the mouth of a kindergartner or an elementary school student, something that's just completely unrealistic and makes no sense at all. Uh, basically, they want to be given everything just for breathing air and taking up space. Wow. So my reaction to this went from hate and disgust to kind of a humorous reaction to it. In fact, when I was writing up my notes for this presentation, my first instinct was to kind of do a, a parody uh, with this and, and parody what they were doing and, and, and take it from a humorous perspective. But the more I thought about it and, and the more in-depth I thought about it, I then went from thinking of it in a humorous vein to thinking of it in terms of pity. You know, I went from hating these people to laughing at these people and now sort of having pity for these people or feeling sorry for them. And I feel sorry for them, I have pity for them, because I think, you know, because first of all, I, I, I realize when I actually sit and think about it, this was not meant to be funny. This was not meant to be humorous. These kids actually believe this crap. And that's where it really set in for me. That these ideas, whether you want to call them disgusting or funny, these kids actually buy it. And that's what kind of hit me like a ton of bricks. You might remember, uh, back in March or April, when we first started this show, I, I did a, a little four-part series on What's wrong with youth of America? I'm not going to go back through all of that. It was, it was a long presentation. I'm not going to go back through all that, but, but we did mention how a bunch of kids who would vote for Barack Obama without even questioning him and, and get caught up in all that hype, that that was such a surprise to me, that the kids who allegedly were so educated and smart could fall for something that simple and trivial and stupid, and yet they did. And I think this uh, protest and, and these alleged demands, I, I think these show a similar example of that. This type of thinking, and the fact that these kids could be easily roped into something so simplistic and unrealistic and almost humorous, if it weren't true, that these kids could be, could be wrapped up in that is the result of a couple of generations of miseducation, maybe some bad parenting, and a society that has a moral vacuum. A lot of the things that helped shape our younger generations before have been missing for this generation. And this kind of crap is the result from it. The election of a Barack Obama is the result of it. Kids who think that they're entitled to a free college education, that's the result from it. Kids who think that people who have money and have wealth automatically owe them some of that money for no reason, that's the result. And that's where it becomes rather sobering. So... What I decided to do with this presentation tonight, instead of poking fun at it, instead of doing a parody, instead of being lighthearted about it, it strikes me that there's a lot of people in this generation of, of young people, in their 20s, early 30s maybe, that need to have a bit of a heart-to-heart -heart discussion. They need to have an adult conversation with somebody for once. They need to kind of have the facts of life explained to them. No, I don't mean the facts of life about what happens when a, when a boy meets a girl. Oh, they, they know all about that from their, from their education. Uh, they, they don't know much else, but they know how to put a condom on a cucumber. No, I mean a real conversation about what it means to be an adult. A real conversation about what it means to transition from adolescence to adulthood and the responsibilities that, that entails, what you can expect. Because what we've seen on Wall Street, what we've seen over the last couple of years in terms of the election of Barack Obama, it tells me that these young people have not grown into adulthood. Oh, they are the age where they're considered adults, in their 20s, maybe in their 30s. But their behavior is not that of an adult. It's time for them to grow up. So maybe, just maybe, considering that maybe a, a parent did not ever have this conversation with them, or a grandparent did not ever have this conversation with a lot of them, or maybe a teacher or a coach should have had that conversation with them and they never did, maybe a clergy member, maybe some mature adult in their life should have had this conversation with them and they didn't, I suppose it falls to me to have that conversation, that heart-to-heart, -heart, 
with these young people, these protesters, these idiots, to bring them into adulthood and to tell them the way the world really is. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you people, any of you who are listening, any of you protesters or any of you young folks who think the system is out to get you, I'm going to give you three very simple rules for living your life. Three very simple rules for adulthood. Let's call it that. Now, let me be clear. This is not necessarily a political conversation. I suppose there's some things we'll talk about tonight that will bleed over into politics a bit. But this is more a conversation about how you look at the world. What you are responsible for. What others are responsible for when it comes to you. How you should live your life. A conversation of right versus wrong. This is not about so much left versus right. Although I think you'll see where it comes into play. But no, this is a conversation about what it means to be an adult. So I'm going to give you kids three rules that you can listen to and you can live by and will make you a better person. Rule number one. You are entitled to nothing. Nah, zero, zip, nothing. Same for me. I'm entitled to nothing. You're entitled to nothing. I'm entitled to nothing. You have no expectation that anybody owes you anything. I have no expectation that anybody owes me anything. You should not consider yourself entitled to a job. You should not consider yourself entitled to an education. You should not consider yourself entitled to a living wage or any other kind of wage for that matter that you have not negotiated yourself. You should not consider yourself entitled to food. You should not entitled, consider yourself entitled to water. You should not consider yourself entitled to air or anything else. The only things you are entitled to are what you go out and get the basic needs in life, however you, deter, however you define that term. The basic needs in life are not something you are entitled to. You should have no expectation that the basic needs in life will be provided to you. Instead, you should have an expectation, just as I do and just as millions of other functioning adults do, you should have the expectation that the basic needs in life are things that you will have to go out there and attain. And beyond that, your wants are things that you can go out there and attain as well. You see, the striving to attain the basic needs of life that's what makes us better as individuals. That's what makes us realize our potential. That's what makes us strive. When you go back to, to the Depression era and you think of all the people that later on in life in the 50s and 60s went on to create great businesses and, and, and become wealthy themselves, so much of it came for a lot of them because they had no choice. They couldn't fail. If they didn't succeed, they wouldn't eat. That's where true motivation comes from. And so when you are in an environment where your basic needs are provided for you or where you have the assumption that, that you will have food and water and a roof over your head and a job and a salary and so forth, then you will never have the hunger you need to strive to be your best. You will always be only a fraction of what you potentially could be. One thing I would tell you, I feel like I'm giving a, a graduation speech to some graduating class here, but my God, I think every high school and college graduate needs to hear this. There's one thing I'd tell you, it's that competition drives man to his best. Competition with each other for our basic needs and for our wants. Competition drives man to his best, but cooperation can drive man to his worst. Because when cooperation's involved now, your bets are hedged a little bit. Now you have the option of failure. Now you don't necessarily have to produce because someone can come in the other direction and make up for it. Think about all those group projects you did back in school. What happened on almost every one of those? You have a group of five or six people, but it would always end up being one or two people that did all the work. And a lot of you out there, and I was this person, I'll admit it, a lot of you out there probably were that person that kind of let them do all the work and you know just kind of showed up on the day you turned it in. I was that guy. There's no shame in that. The reason that you or I could get away with that is because we knew 
that we were covered. We knew that in, in that grand number of people in that group that we could kind of become lost and we weren't going to be held responsible for what we did or didn't do. Well, look around you in society. You see the same thing today. The wealthy are not a symbol of your failure. Instead, they are a symbol of your potential success. They are people who have strived to attain their basic needs and their wants and maybe more and have succeeded in that. They are what you should emulate, not what you should criticize. You should not rebel against them. You should not chastise them. You should instead try to learn from them. A lot of you probably have the potential to be as successful as they have been, but your head's been turned around wrong. The second rule of adulthood. Society has no responsibility for your quality of life. Likewise, you have no responsibility to society. I mean, sure, we all pay our taxes, and that's fine. We all should pay a, a, an equal percentage. Sadly, we're not anywhere near that. But beyond that, you don't have a responsibility for me. And guess what? I don't have a responsibility for you. Those fat cats on Wall Street that you're complaining about, they have zero responsibility for you. You should be disgusted with yourself that you're even demanding anything from them. What have you ever done for them? They don't owe you anything. You don't owe them anything. Go back to rule number one on that. Everything in life revolves around self-interest. Now, when I make that statement, when I say that, a lot of people kind of get disgusted or they cringe or they, they view that in a negative context. But instead, I think you should view that in a positive context. Everything in life revolves around your own self-interest. Everything in my life revolves around my self-interest. To a Wall Street banker, everything in their life revolves around their self-interest. To a corporate jet owner, everything in their life should revolve around their self-interest. I view that as a positive thing. Because when everything in your life revolves around your own self-interest, that means you have the opportunity to pursue anything you want, any course of study, any line of work, any interest you have. You have the opportunity in this country to pursue it. My God, the sky's the limit for you. You don't have to do anybody else's bidding unless you allow yourself to. And unless you agree to do it for an agreed upon price. Why are you protesting that? My God, that's freedom. That's what it's all about. You have the opportunity to pursue whatever you want and you're disgusted with that? You want to have someone come in and restrict that? I don't get it. Sometimes it seems like these protesters and a lot of these kids are looking for looking for government to have their best interests at heart, or maybe even looking for a political candidate like a Barack Obama to have their best interests at heart. They're looking, they're looking for someone to fight for them. They're looking for someone to be their advocate. And I think that's where they're missing something very key. Let me uh, be very clear on this, and this is not just political in nature. You, you can take what I'm about to say here, and you can apply it to any area of your life. Anytime you meet somebody who claims to have your best interests at heart, then that is a red flag. That is a person who is trying to pull the wool over your eyes and trying to control you. Anyone who tells you that they'll fight as hard for you as they will themselves, they're trying to lull you into a false sense of security. And they're trying to control you for their own means. Remember, to every human being, their own self-interest is paramount. So by definition, that means when someone tells you that your self-interest means as much to them as their own, they are lying to you. And this should have been the red flag that you saw during the campaign of Barack Obama. When he positioned himself as your candidate, the man who would help equalize things for you, and would go to bat for you, Bull! No human being will go to bat for anyone else unless there's something in it for them. And for a generation that was allegedly so educated and allegedly so smart, and I've said this on this program before, that shocked me 
that you guys would be so gullible as to fall for it. Obama, and nobody else for that matter, cares about you any more than anybody else. The only person in life, the only person in life who will have your self-interest at heart is the man you look at in the mirror every morning. That's it. And anyone who tells you otherwise, they're trying to get something out of you. As I said before, the corporations, putting that in quotes, corporations, Wall Street, the system, all these vague things that you're protesting right now, it's ludicrous to think that they have any responsibility for you. They do not. They are responsible to themselves and their shareholders. The only person who has any responsibility for you is you. I don't have any responsibility for you. I don't care what happens to you. You don't have any responsibility for me. I don't expect you to care what happens to me. That's part of being an adult. And the final of the three rules of adulthood I'm going to give you. Robin Hood was not someone to be admired. Instead, he was a thief. We've probably all heard the old phrase, the old story about give a man a fish, you'll feed him for a day, teach a man to fish, you'll feed him for a lifetime. It's kind of a cliche. I know we all understand that. But a lot of times in life, the reason we have cliches is because at the end of the day, they're true. And this one certainly is true. No matter how well intended, well phrased, well thought out, the idea of taking property from achievers and giving it to non-achievers is, no matter how well intended it is, it always ends up being theft. No matter how good it sounds to hear someone say, we're going to tax the wealthy more, or we're going to take from the wealthy, or we're going to make them pay their fair share, despite the fact they're already paying more than their fair share, no matter how good that sounds, no matter how much of an applause line it is in the speech, every single time that it's implemented, it brings out the worst in human behavior and not the best. And the reason it brings out the worst in human behavior is because it kills motivation. It kills that inherent get up and go gene that I guess we have. I don't know what you call it. But that little thing inside us it gets us out of bed every morning to make today a little bit better than yesterday was. To add a little bit more to what we have to give a little bit more to our family. Well, when that's given to you by those who have already done the work, then there's no reason for you to do the work. And there you see the, the lack of morality, the lawlessness that you see in our poor areas. That's where that comes from. It's the lack of character that brings out the problems that the poor have. It's not the fact that someone has more money from them. It's not even the poverty itself that brings that out. It's the lack of character that led to the poverty to begin with. In such an environment, you sap the motivation and growth potential from a lot of people. We've talked on this program before about the African American community and how they were coming along so well prior to the, the Great Society, prior to the 1960s. In spite of all the Jim Crow laws and in spite of all the discrimination that was out there, they were doing pretty well. They, they were increasing their wages over a 40-year period. They were, they were really moving up through the ranks. And then the Great Society came along and put them back down. And the reason it put them back down was because it replaced the self-motivation that was driving so many of these folks. And it replaced, replaced it with a mentality that the government would then give them the means for survival. And when the means of survival are given to you, when you don't have to work for it, when you don't have to go out and attain it yourself, you will become lazy. You will become slothful. You will become immoral. And now, look at darn near any inner city you want to go to and see the war zone that it is. But yet, those of you who are protesting, you're effectively protesting in favor of that kind of environment. You're protesting in favor of a situation where those who have contributed more to society, those who bring more to the table, those who are smarter, work harder, more innovative, where we take what they've gained and give it to those who do not have those abilities. 
Well, if we give to those without those abilities, how in the hell are they going to develop those abilities? They won't. There'll be no reason to. As a result, in those situations, the adults who are given the wealth that is redistributed from those who have worked hard, those adults remain children. They remain adolescents. They are never forced to become adults. I mean, I, I bet you, and any of you who are fortunate enough to still have grandparents around or great-grandparents, people who lived through the 40s and the Depression, ask them sometime about the difference between an 18-year-old man back then and an 18-year-old man today. I mean, an 18-year-old man back in the 40s, my God, he, he, he probably either was on his way to going to war, or if he was at home, was holding down a job and holding down a family and meeting his responsibilities. An 18-year-old man today, well, they even call it, I've seen articles where they call it extended adolescence. He's, he's expected to do no more than just show up for some kind of schooling, go out and drink, go out and party, go out and have sex. And just have fun. My God, which one of those is more mature? Well, that latter version I'm telling you about, the modern 18-year-old, is the result of an environment in which the basic needs are provided. In which there is that safety net that the liberals love to talk about. Either in terms of education or wealth or basic needs. Healthcare now being the newest attachment to it. And so these 18-year-olds, these 20-year-old men, are really boys. They don't know how to. They don't know how to fend for themselves. They don't know how to make effective change in their lives. We have retarded their development, and that's what you people are protesting in favor of. Extending your adolescence even further. Maintaining your immaturity into your late 20s and your 30s, and God knows how long. It's time for you people to grow up. It's time for you people to become adults. And it's time for you to make a decision. Who are you? Are you a person who is strong enough, mature enough, confident enough in your own ability, and to be self-sufficient? If you're that kind of person, if you know you can do what you need to do in life, if you know that any hope and change you need can come from within and you don't need it given to you from the outside, then in terms of politics and in terms of culture, you should be on our side. We in the Tea Party, we, we who are conservatives, we on the right, that's what we stand for. Individual responsibility, self-sufficiency, rugged individualism. That's what we are. And if you're man enough to believe in that, we got a place for you. You'll fit in real well with us. But on the other side of that coin, if you're weak, if you're an overgrown adolescent, if you look at your situation in life and your first reaction is to whine about Wall Street or the wealthy instead of taking responsibility for what you haven't done or what you haven't achieved, then you stay on the left. And I feel sorry for you. Because it's people like you and the expectations, the unrealistic expectations, the unfathomable expectations that you have that have put this country on the brink. It's generations of people like you that think you're entitled to the basic necessities of life, that you're entitled to some kind of safety net just for showing up, that have put this country on the brink of bankruptcy. It's time for this generation, those idiots out on those protests all across the country now, it's time for you to grow up. It's time for you to be an adult. And frankly, if you're a mature person, if you're an adult person, if you're an intelligent person, you have no choice but to join the conservative movement and to help us take this country back to a more conservative place fiscally, morally, and socially. 
This is America's Evil Genius. We'll see you next week.